Uh, my lecture this afternoon is on Aristotle, who lived from uh, 384 to 322 BC. Uh, Aristotle was not, unlike Plato, was not an Athenian. Uh, he was born in a small city state called Stagira, but he spent uh, most of his early his early years were spent in Macedon. Uh, his father was the physician to the king of Macedon. And as a uh, young man, Aristotle went to Athens, where he studied for a number of years with Plato. Plato founded his own school called the Academy. Uh, Aristotle was a student there for. Uh, 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 quite a long time. Uh, then uh, Aristotle later, uh, at least according to most accounts, was a tutor to Alexander the Great, who was the son of King Philip of Macedon. I, I was when I was preparing for these lectures, I was surprised to read there are some writers, such as Richard Kraut in his book on Aristotle, who claim that. Uh, it may not be the case, it may be false that Aristotle was, uh, Philip, uh, was Alexander the Great's tutor. This may just be a legend, although he doesn't give any claims on this. But uh, I've been assured by competent authority that most people, most scholars, accept that he was the tutor of Alexander the Great. Uh, as, you, as you know, uh, the Philip of Macedon uh, really became the dominant power in Greece. He was in a, a war against the various other city-states, with Athens as one of his main opponents. In the famous famous battle in 338 BC, the Battle of Chironia, uh, Philip of Macedon defeated the Athenians, and then uh, there was a provincial governor who was uh, who was appointed by the Macedonian government, I mean, Anitus, I think, who was uh, in control of, uh, of Athens. And, uh, Aristotle had resumed residence in Athens. Remember, he was not, as I say, he was not an Athenian. He was not a citizen of Athens. Uh, at that time, unlike today, uh, people, say, couldn't, when they lived in a place for a number of years, you couldn't just take out naturalization papers to try to become a citizen. Uh, a citizen in Athens had to be, at least from 450 BC, had to be uh, a, a dis, uh, have parents who were citizens. So Aristotle was a non-resident alien in Athens, in uh, so-called medic, M-E-T-I-C. Uh, put this down. Uh, not to be confused with medic, that's a different word. Uh, so uh, although it, the reason I mentioned that is, uh, as you'll see, Aristotle had a good deal to say, when he was talking about the best form of government, or various forms of government, had a good deal to say about citizens and citizenship. But he himself was not a citizen of Athens, even though he spent a lot of time there. Then uh, in the uh, there was a, uh, uh, Philip of Macedon meanwhile, had been, was assassinated in 336 BC. And then uh, eventually uh, Alexander, uh, his son Alexander took over. But in the last years of Aristotle's residence in Athens, there was a uh, revolt against the Macedonian government. Uh, there was an anti-Macedonian party headed by Demosthenes, the famous uh, orator, famous speaker. And for a while, uh, in his last year, uh, Aristotle had to get out of Athens. He left the city. I think there's, there's a story he said he, he wanted to avoid ha having the city uh, commit a crime against philosophy twice. So uh, in his last years, he, he in his last uh, years he left Athens. Uh, now, at the time he wrote, as I, I mentioned, uh, Athens was, had uh, 
lost it to uh, was uh, to uh, the Macedonians after the battle in the battle of, at the battle of Chironia. But even before that, Athens wasn't as powerful as it had been in the previous centuries. Like the number of citizens declined to about thirty thousand at one time. They had over sixty to seventy thousand. Now they just had about thirty thousand. So they weren't the power they once were at the time Aristotle was writing, even before their loss to the Macedonians. Uh, now, in, Aristotle had uh, two main works that uh, are of interest to political philosophy. Uh, he wrote first uh, the Nicomachean Ethics and also the Politics. He also wrote uh, another book on ethics, Eudemian Ethics, and some of the books of the two are, identi are, this, are identical, but I won't be going into what the various views are of the relation between the two uh, treatises. Uh, most scholars hold that the, the Aristotle's views on ethics are really the, the best source for them is the Nicomachean ethics, although uh, Sir Anthony Kenny has argued the, uh, the reverse, that the Eudemian ethics is the most important one, but he's, that's a very much a minority view. It, in the last book of the Nicomachean Ethics, uh, Aristotle indicates that ethics is really part of another discipline uh, called uh, politike, which is a political science that really, uh, as I'll be explaining a bit later, uh, the person, the individual, really can only lead the good life in a polis, in a, a city-state, and so this really makes politics the supreme science, not ethics, meaning ethics of individual living. And in the politics, is, he really takes up the themes of uh, of the uh, of the ethics, explaining exactly what the nature of this supreme science is. I should say also before I start on the main parts of Aristotle's argument, there are various uh, theories on uh, how these, both the Nicomachean ethics and politics were composed. What we have now are apparently lecture notes that are uh, students have transmitted of what Aristotle said. Uh, but there are various views on stages that they might, that uh, the books might have gone through, or how uh, how the book should be in these treatises should be arranged. The uh, German uh, philologist Werner Jaeger was one of the main uh, people er, er, early in the, say writing in the 1920s and 30s who argued there was a sort of stages in Aristotle's development, but and he had uh, very elaborate theories, say, on how how Aristotle had composed his books and how the, the book should be arranged. But that's uh, an issue I won't be going into. I'll just be taking the books as we have them. Uh, I remember when I was talking about Plato, I was mentioning he attached supreme importance to the philosophers knowing the form of the good this was what entitled them to their ruling position in the Callipolis, the beautiful city of the Republic. But it wasn't clear in reading Plato what exactly the idea of the good was or how we were supposed to know it. It was just people somehow, the philosophers after training, it had some contact with the idea. They grasped the idea. Plato has a famous metaphor where the, uh, you're, the people are in a cave, and then some come out, or some are freed, and turn around, and they see the sunlight. But it isn't clear how, uh, what they actually saw, or how this. If you take the metaphor and try to spell it out, it isn't clear what's involved in this. In fact, one of Aristotle's criticisms of Plato, he made many criticisms of Plato, although he was. Plato's student, he was by no means Plato's faithful disciple. One of his criticisms of Plato is that Plato often 
reasons by metaphor and analogy, and he doesn't specify exactly what he what he means. He doesn't spell out in uh, propositions that we can analyze and argue about what his contentions are. Uh, uh, Aristotle, I think, was much more methodologically self-conscious than uh, Plato. He was certainly, unlike uh, Plato, he wasn't a, a great literary artist, but he was very, uh, c very much concerned with set giving the exact structures of an argument. In in the Nicomachean Ethics and also the Politics, he follows a. a particular method of proceeding where he, it's a, a somewhat empirical method. He starts with uh, views that are commonly accepted or believed, and then he tries to first uh, make these more systematic and ask questions about them and try to, uh, not necessarily accepting everything that uh, uh, come believe whole, but he, he starts off from that basis. He says we have there are certain commonly accepted beliefs, and so we start from that, and we don't just start say just trying to think of things on our own and just say, well, uh, we want to ask what's the best life, so we just come up with some idea of our own and then reason on that basis. We start with what's commonly accepted, by, especially he says about ethics, what what is accepted by well brought up people in, in political science. Uh, he, he and the members of his school he founded when he returned to Athens uh, for his second visit. He remember he'd been there the first time he was a student of Plato. When he came back, he founded his own school, which was in, called the Lyceum. Uh, Plato School, the academy, was still in operation. In fact, the uh, academy continued. It was the longest uh, lived institution of education in antiquity. It lasted till it was uh, closed by the uh, Roman Emperor Justinian. But uh, Plato had his own school called the Lyceum in competition with the academy. So uh, Aristotle and the, his students uh, collected uh, wrote uh, accounts of the constitutions of the various of city-states in Greece. And I think there were about 158 of these that they wrote. Well, only one of has survived called the Constitution of Athens. There's uh, some question whether it was Aristotle or one of his students who wrote the Constitution of Athens. This was, in any event, it, it just shows that they were Aristotle was very, uh, very much in contrast to Plato. He was very concerned with observation of what was actually taking place before he started theorizing him, himself. He was in this way a, an empiricist, uh, and as as we'll see later, he didn't he he didn't accept uh, Plato's theory of forms. Uh, Now, there's an obvious objection to proceeding in the way, this, by this way of saying, uh, in ethics, what we start with saying, what are the beliefs that people well brought up would hold? If, how do we know which people are well brought up? Isn't that begging the question in a way that we're assuming that we say uh, the good, good Idea that the ideas we should follow about the good are what the well brought up people have. But how do we know what the well brought up people have? Well, those are just the ones who have the ideas we think are good. So that the uh, claim is that if we proceed in this way, if we try to make systematic the uh, common be beliefs people hold, if we say that we took we're trying to come up with a contemporary ethics. He said, well, what do people today think is reasonable? Like say, we say, well, a lot of people today think the government should provide various welfare services to people. So view, say, if, we hold, if other people 
deny this, but if those views aren't, say, say a libertarian says, no, the government shouldn't do this, then we say, well, the libertarian is, con is in conflict with what the well-brought-up people say, so we can just cut that view out. We should say this is an obviously absurd view, so we can dismiss this. Now, there's some people who actually adopt that style of argument. I remember the uh, Hillary Putnam, who was a very influential Harvard philosopher, was once uh, wrote an essay where he commented in passing on libertarianism. He said, well, look, libertarianism, uh, he has great respect for Robert Nozick, who was that time a colleague of his. But he said, look, this is obviously a system we have to reject because if libertarianism were correct, then we wouldn't have public education. And everybody knows we, we ought to have public education. So this is, uh, shows that we can just reject the libertarian view out of hand. So we wonder, so the question would come up, is Aristotle involved in a similar failing? Not, of course, that he's discussing libertarianism, but is he saying something like, we want to figure out what the views are of the well-brought-up people, but he's just assuming that certain class of people who were educated Greeks of his time have the correct opinions. So he's systematizing the beliefs that people actually hold, but he's not coming up with any truth of his own. Uh, this is actually a similar criticism of the uh, Ronald Dworkin, who's an influential legal philosopher, raised this criticism against uh, John Rawls, who's the most influential 20th century political philosopher. Rawls had a procedure which he calls reflective equilibrium, which is a very Aristotelian procedure in which we take the beliefs we actually have, say, about justice and morality, we try to make it systematic, and then we come up with theories that will try to account for our beliefs and then see, test these against the various beliefs we have and then keep adjusting the theories and the beliefs till we get a good fit or a fit that satisfies us. So Dworkin objects, you know, when imagining uh, uh, someone could object to Aristotle, say, well, look, what we'll come up with is not, is just a systematic account of beliefs we happen to hold, but they, we won't, we won't know, how do we know these beliefs or give us truth in any sense? They'll just be telling us what we actually think is the case, but how we know they're true. Uh, now, uh, Aristotle I think, was quite aware of this objection. He had uh, a way of answering this. And there's a good discussion of this point in a book by uh, Terence Irwin. Terence Irwin is one of the leading uh, American scholars on uh, classical Greek philosophy. He has a very long book called Aristotle's First Principles. And he says uh, Aristotle had, besides the procedure I've so far mentioned, where we try to systematize our common beliefs, in this he calls weak dialectic. Aristotle had a supplementary uh, procedure called strong dialectic, where he tried, Aristotle tried to develop certain views just based on what he thought were correct metaphysical principles. So he would then test the views, the, the views that were systematizing what the well brought up people would say against what the conclusions that he thought he could establish independently by this uh, uh, resort to metaphysical principles. And this procedure where you bring in not only the beliefs that we, the common people, the well brought up people back, but also the philosophical beliefs, this he called strong, Erwin called strong dialectic. So he said that Aristotle is really combining both weak dialectic and strong dialectic. And I think we could see also uh, whether Aristotle is successful in this, of course, we'll, that's something we'll have to look at. But you can see also there's a response we could give, I think we could give, uh, defending Aristotle's procedure of starting from the beliefs we actually have about ethics is uh, we can't really do 
anything else, we really have to start with the beliefs we actually have. If we reject these beliefs, uh, that can only be by because we find them somehow in conflict with other beliefs we have that we're prepared to stick with and uh, uh, think uh, are more justifiable than the first belief. We can't wipe the slate clean, as it were, and just start with nothing at all, then we uh, we would not be able to proceed anywhere. We really have to. We really have no alternative to begin with the actual beliefs we have. Unless I suppose one could say, well, somebody could just say, maybe we don't can't have any knowledge of morality, but we have beliefs about other things. I suppose if one could adopt that position, but that would be a rather nihilistic view. It would be not. So if we wanted to avoid that, if we claim we can have moral knowledge at all, we pretty much do have to start with our own beliefs. Now this, as I say, is in general Aristotle's method of proceeding, but now how did he actually carry this out in his, in his work? Well, he says in the Nicomachean Ethics, he says, well, uh, We want to start, he starts with this argument. He said, whenever, or he gives this argument, he said, when, whenever we act, whenever anybody does anything, there's an end or a goal that he's aiming at. Say, I, uh, when you, when, whatever you do, you have some purpose for what you're doing. Now, he says, well, suppose you ask what, given you have this purpose, why did you do that? What is the purpose of that? What's the purpose of, of that? What's, you could come up with some other end for that. You say, well, uh, supposing I say I'm giving these lectures in order because I'm going to be getting some money in return uh, for, for doing that, not that I could be motivated by so uh, a mercenary a motive, but just giving this hypothetically. All right, suppose I say, well, I'm going to get some money. Then I say, well, what do I want the money for? Then I could give various other things. Maybe I want to spend it on various other things. Then I say, well, what do I want them for? So Aristotle said, well, uh, we can't just keep going back infinite series that way. We can't say, uh, my end for acting is doing to do I'm doing A to get B, I'm doing B to get C, doing C to get D. We can't just keep going back in some infinite series because then I won't really have any real reason to do anything. I would have a reason to do anything only if I had an end that wasn't didn't require any further justification in terms of another end. So Aristotle says, there must be then some ultimate end at which people aim. And then he raised the question, what is that? Now, uh, some people have objected, uh, all sorts of people raise this objection. Uh, Robert Nozick is one of these, that this involves a logical fallacy. Let, let me put this down here. Uh, what was I say? Uh, Uh, so we have every action involved an end, then if one's avoid an infinite regress, or say we could have a circular a sort of a, a loop where you had something is an, an end and then that returns as a means to something else that we've already put in, uh, or let's put this kind of circular uh, loop. Uh, there, uh, the, uh, 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 
action uh, 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 how should I put this it uh, doesn't have any further end uh, so uh, then he says uh, therefore uh, there is a, a final or highest end. Now, uh, can anyone tell me uh, what, the way I've put the argument so far, uh, what's the fallacy in this argument? Uh, well, I see. I can see. As you see, I probably uh, it's too uh, obvious. It's apparently it's too obvious to require statement. Uh, the fallacy is uh, the, the whether uh, I'll be doing in a minute whether Aristotle committed this is suppo supposing it's the case that you have to for each action you have to have an end that is not just is not justified by some further end. So for each action there is an stopping point to the series. Well, it doesn't follow from that that there has to be a single end that you're always aiming for. It's just in each case where you have an action, there's some final end. But how do we know that all these final ends, have, why do they have to all be the same one? Maybe it's just people have a there's a series, it just says that you have a series of, of chains in which there's a stopping point for each one, but why do they all have to stop at the same place? Uh, perhaps you can see the fallacy a little more clearly if we say something like, we say, instead of saying every, every action has an end, suppose we just take a structurally similar statement, we say every person has a father which is, I think, a true statement. Now then we, we instead of saying every, every action has an end, then we say, uh, obviously, so then we say, instead of saying there mu there's some end that's the same, that's the goal of all action, we put in the, uh, we substitute, we say someone is everybody's father, just as we said, you know, instead of saying every uh, every instead of saying every action has an end, we say every person has a father. And then we say instead of saying there's some, uh, then therefore there's some end that's the goal of all action. We say therefore somebody's someone is everyone's father. Well, that doesn't follow at all. In fact, that's a false proposition. It, everyone has a father, but it doesn't follow that somewhat that some particular person is everybody's father. That would, I think, is a, seems like an unlikely hypothesis. Uh, at least I, uh, so, uh, similarly, the claim is Aristotle has made, it's been claimed Aristotle has made a, a lot of simple fallacies here. He's thinking that because you have to terminate every chain of actions to be rational in some final end, there's a single final end that holds for all action. But as, as I don't think really Aristotle was guilty of this fallacy. I think uh, Jennifer Whiting, if I'm not mistaken, has a good article on this. What Aristotle was really suggesting, uh, I think what he would say in response to this, he said, what if there are all sorts of different final ends that people have? He'd say, well, then you, you just have to, the question could then be raised, how do you Make, what, how do these various final ends relate to each other if they're just kind of in, they don't, they're just kind of in some kind of haphazard order. This is really not a rational way of proceeding that if we have claimed that there are multiple ends without any further questions to be asked about, we should kind of arrange these systematically in some way and this is what would give us uh, our notion of the good, we would want to know how do these, how are these various ends to be related. So, 
Now, if then, in some sense, we're aiming at a the good that doesn't, an end that doesn't require any justification in terms of further ends, then the question comes up, well, uh, can we say anything about this? How do we know what that end is? Uh, and here is where uh, Aristotle resorts to uh, his his uh, general philosophy, engages in what I called earlier following Terence Irwin's strong dialectic. Uh, Aristotle has the view in metaphysics that uh, every substance, a substance is just a sort of the independent thing that exists, something can be the subject of predicates. Uh, every substance has an essence or nature. So what are, say, if I say, uh, uh, what is the essence of, of an oak tree, it would be uh, sort of what is the structure of the tree? What are giving? What are the essential properties of the tree? There's something that uh, they say the tree would just have contingently, but there's something that constitutes, say, an oak tree as an oak tree. What are the characteristics such that without these characteristics, it wouldn't be a tree, an oak tree at all? And it's something. Uh, we in the Aristotelian scheme of things we have kind of we have for physical objects we have kind of a they're composed of matter but there's a kind of a shape or structure or form of this matter that really uh, is how we know what the essence is. the essence is the form that the thing has a structure so uh, if we're trying to find out what is the what is the good what is the final end we have to ask what is the nature of human beings? Uh, and he holds that, uh, here he holds that everything, uh, sometimes things don't realize, don't really achieve their nature all at once, but if something doesn't really achieve its nature all at once, there's a natural tendency in the thing to realize its nature. Say just as we imagine, say a, a, a tree starts off as a seed and grows into a tree. There, there is a, a, a internal process by which the fi the 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 nature really acts as, kind of, as the goal of the uh, of the growth of the tree. That what the the say to use the example given, the oak tree will grow in a certain way because that's its nature, its, uh, its final end really is somehow is determining the process of its growth. This doesn't, it, it, at the same time, this doesn't mean that there aren't things that are bringing about, external things that are bringing about the uh, growth of the tree, but they go along with the final causation there four types of cause in Aristotle. There's the things that are sort of happening to bring about what is called the physical change. We imagine, say, uh, somebody's planted the seed, he's watering the seed and so on. These are efficient causes. They're bringing something about. But the reason the, the tree develops in this way is not explained just by the efficient cause, but it's the pattern that, uh, that uh, Acts the, the the essence really acts as kind of a guide to the uh, to the growth of tree. This is called the final cause. So human beings are uh, distinct from both uh, physical or physical inanimate matter and also uh, animals, non-human animals, in that human beings have free choice. We can decide whether we want to uh, act to, uh, for, uh, to uh, in the way in accord with our natures or not. So human beings have free choice, and this is what distinguishes us from other uh, animals. So we have the, human beings have the question: Are we going to act in accord with our nature or not? 
it, uh, as you see, this has somewhat of a uh, Randian flavor to it. It sounds like Aristotle has been really reading Ayn Rand, although his, uh, I think his lecture notes on Atlas Shrugged haven't survived. Uh, so now we have a question. Well, if uh, human beings have the choice of whether to uh, realize their nature. What is the nature of human beings? And uh, we've already got most of the answer that, or really the answer that Aristotle says, well, how would we answer this question? We have to ask, what would, how do we distinguish human beings from other entities? Well, uh, they're, uh, they're uh, vegetative, uh, Matter, human, matter, you know, that ha any animate anything that's alive at all has certain, we can say, uh, has certain properties in common. Then we have, uh, we can distinguish further animals that have power of local motion, unlike plants, animals can move from one place to another. And then we have within the animals, there's a higher class that's able to reason. So reason is the distinguishing characteristic of human beings so that if we, uh, if we want to achieve our natures, or want to act in accord with our natures, then we'll do so by exercising our reason. Now, some people have objected to this argument. Uh, Robert Nozick, who's one who's raised this objection, but he isn't the only one. They say, well, uh, Nozick says, well, uh, what is so important about getting a unique characteristic of human beings to get the nature? I mean, supposing uh, it turned out, we, couldn't we come up with all sorts of peculiar characteristics that only human beings have, for example? Supposing it turned out that uh, only human beings laugh at jokes, should we say this is the essential characteristic of human beings. What's so important about a unique characteristic? And then similarly, suppose it, it turned out that there were some of these science fiction stories are true and there turns out to be some, some uh, species on another planet who are, have completely different anatomy or structure from human beings, but it turns out they're rational also. Does this mean that uh, rationality is no longer gives the essence of human beings just because it turns out there's some other uh, species that's also rational. So what's important about uniqueness? But again, I don't think this objection really penetrates the essence of Aristotle's view because I, I think his view isn't so much to come up with some way in which human, you, you could, human beings are absolutely uh, different from other species. So if you say, imagine a case, I think, uh, for example, uh, there's some a big prize, I think it's a million dollars if uh, someone can prove the Riemann hypothesis in mathematics. Suppose a dolphin reads about this, and says, oh, I'm going to prove the Riemann, I've got the proof of the Riemann hypothesis, I want a million dollars. Suppose he does that, does that show, since he's rational, that therefore Aristotle is wrong about uh, the nature of the human species? I, d I don't think so, because what Aristotle is interested in is just saying, how do we characterize human beings? What uh, it, property of human beings will uh, best explain their characteristics? And he thinks this, the answer to this is rationality. So these rather uh, odd cases where uh, other species are also rational in our imagined cases really don't strike at the heart of what Aristotle is doing. So uh, Aristotle then says, well, then if we want to answer our question, how should we live? It should be in accord with our nature, which is the use of reason, with the full exercise of our reason. So Aristotle holds that in it, nature should be characterized by the full, any nature the end is the full exercise of its nature, and so applied to human beings, it would be the full exercise of our reason. Now, uh, how, what does this involve? How, you say we're, we're 
using our reason, how do, what, do we, what do we do if we're trying to find out what's the proper way to live? Well, Aristotle goes through, uh, in, through various suggestions. Here again, he's returning to looking at common belief. Like you said, supposing somebody said that uh, the aim of life is try to get as much pleasure as possible. Well, then he says, we do that, we'll this won't work, we'll find out we're just constantly at the mercy of outside forces. We never really know what's going to happen next. We, we won't be able to have any structure to our lives. We'll just be in a, a constant search for different pleasures, but we won't really get anywhere if we want to be rational, if we want to have our lives organized in a systematic way. This isn't the way to proceed. So uh, this, though, after he rejects other things, such as in similar ways, such as pursuit of honor. So, what then is it, supposing we reject all these false ones, false ideas? What do we actually come up with as the correct idea? How should we live rationally? Well, one way it, it thinks it's probably kind of a reflexive procedure. One way is we think rationally about just this very question, how to live rationally and other questions. So it's somewhat we're thinking uh, uh, somewhat reflexively. We're using our reason. We're trying to take what we think are the, whatever the ends are that we have and kind of arrange them in a systematic way. Uh, so we have, now this view that I'm giving, uh, that we're kind of taking the ends we have and arranging them systematically and organizing them. This is called, this is what I think is the best interpretation of ourselves, it's called the inclusive end view. It's something like we're taking the various ends that survive rational scrutiny and arranging them systematically and having a large place for thinking about reason. Now there's another view that some scholars hold is, uh, play here, place a lot of emphasis on something Aristotle says in Book 10 of the Nicomachean Ethics, where Aristotle says there that uh, contemplation, I mean philosophical contemplation, is really the highest activity. So it seems, according to this view, what Aristotle is really saying is that the supreme life is the life spent uh, doing philosophy, this would be a life only very few people can achieve. So in this way, if you took him to be saying that, he'd be kind of going back in a way uh, to a view that Plato expressed in the Republic, where uh, it's the, the guardians, the, the philosophers are the only ones who really have wisdom. Everybody else really doesn't matter much. But if you adopt this inclusive end view, you wouldn't, it doesn't have that drastic consequence. You would just say, uh, Contemplation is extremely important, but there are other things that are part of a good life also, including uh, political activity. Now, after, uh, after uh, he mentions that they, uh, and how we're supposed to uh, use reason, uh, one thing Aristotle does is he gives particular it gives a specification of particular virtues that people uh, have. Uh, and here he has uh, the theoretical virtues and also uh, practical virtues, virtues of practical reason, which is reasoning about how we act, how to act, uh, like say in, in ethics or in our daily life, how we act. And here there is a division here, there is kind of a uh, guiding virtue, which is called uh, practical reason, phronesis, is kind of telling us how, this is the, the what I've been talking about when I've talked about reason as organizing our ends. This is uh, pre pretty much what I have in mind. Uh, sort of the practical reason is kind of a wisdom of how we live our lives. And then there are particular virtues of action that are involved in how we carry out the various actions that we want to do. And these are involved such things as courage and uh, temperance. And here's where 
Aristotle gives the famous view that uh, uh, virtues are a mean between the between the extremes. So, and what he means by this is that for each of the virtues, there are vices on both sides of the of the virtue. Say we could imagine, say, say courage. We could imagine courage is someone who meets the uh, uh, situations where he's in danger with the right amount of the appropriate amount of of uh, valor. We could imagine somebody supposing someone. We could have a vice of excess. Someone, let's say. Uh, Let's imagine something like a penny go, rolls into the street and somebody rushes out into moving traffic to get, to get it back. We could say, well, this person is very rash because he's risking his own life. He, we could say, well, uh, wouldn't you think he's very brave because he doesn't care that he's, he, he's able to do this even though uh, he's not afraid. Most people wouldn't do such a thing because even if they tried it, they'd be too scared to do it. But this person is afraid. But Aristotle wouldn't say this person is being courageous. He's being foolhardy because he's risking his life to no purpose. And then we can imagine on the other side, someone, say, uh, refuses. There's a fire and he won't go in, say, to rescue his family, even though he has a good chance of doing so. Uh, because he's too afraid to do it, so this person is too, too timorous. He's too afraid. So the Aristotle says the the, the virtue is a mean between the two vices. Uh, now uh, there is one point about uh, courage. I think perhaps one could raise an objection to what Aristotle says here. Is that uh, supposing someone always correctly judged that situations were too dangerous to uh, be worth risking his life, there are various. Say, imagine he's a soldier in battle, and he always correctly judges that you want it's best to retreat. Uh, would it seems like it would be odd to say that such, such a person would be using good judgment, but it would seem to be odd to say he's courageous. But perhaps Aristotle could just respond to that by saying, well, then we would have to ask, how would the person have acted in cases where his, his life or his uh, other thing, the value were at stake? How would he have acted in those cases? So it, uh, perhaps we would have to bring in the counterfactual here to get to answer this. But we, uh, we, I just give that as kind of a sideline that perhaps there's an objection there that someone who always uh, thought prudence the better part of valor and always acted prudently and avoided risk could still count as courageous on Aristotle's definition. Now, one thing before I, I turn from this topic that I think is an important mistake to avoid is when Aristotle says that the, the uh, virtue is a mean between two vices, he doesn't mean by this that a virtuous person will always will sort of always act in a half-hearted way, or will never exert himself to the full. You say, uh, let's say someone is extremely enthusiastic about his work; he pours everything he has into a project. Uh, it, this would not be acting in an un-Aristotelian way. It isn't that you're not supposed to uh, give your all-out effort. It's just the mean is just that it's there for each virtue. We can identify two vices, one on each side of it. It isn't how much you're supposed to exert yourself. You're only supposed to exert yourself to a limited extent. That isn't what Aristotle is saying. I should say. Uh, there's an exception to the Aristotle's principle that every virtue is a mean between two vices. He thinks that justice isn't a mean between two vices. Uh, this point, this Aristotelian point, led to a, a
famous incident in American political history. Uh, some of you may be old enough to remember this. In the 1964 uh, presidential campaign, the, Barry Goldwater, who was the, uh, the conservative Republican candidate, said in his acceptance speech for the Republican nomination, uh, I would remind you that extremism in the defense of liberty is not a vice and moderation in the pursuit of justice is not a virtue. Now, his, that part of the speech was written by Harry Jaffa, who was the father of Leo Strauss and has uh, uh, written a book on Aristotle, Thomism, and Aristotelianism. So Jaffa was making a good Aristotelian point there in, uh, Goldwater, in what he wrote for Goldwater's sake. Unfortunately, that wasn't the best time to be making points about Aristotle's politics. And hit that statement cost Goldwater a good deal in the campaign because his enemies were then able to picture him as an extremist. Now, uh, I've spent a good deal of time on Aristotle. Oh, I should say one point I haven't gone into. When I said that uh, uh, practical wisdom with Phronese is involved really systematizing our ends, there's really uh, something that goes against that that I don't think, in a sense, really does what he says. Aristotle says, uh, deliberation is of means and not ends. But here, what I think, I don't think there's a real contradiction, you know, because what Aristotle means when he says that, the deliberation means is end. He's just talking by deliberation, just has in mind what we're doing when we've settled a particular goal, and then we're asking how, it, how are we supposed to achieve that goal. So he's, I, do, I, I don't think he's meaning by deliberation. He just, he's not extending that to all kind of rational activity. Quite the contrary, it's, it's essential to his view that we can have some kind of structure to our ends and order them rationally by practical wisdom. So the uh, reason I've spent a good deal of time talking about Ar Aristotle's ethics is I think uh, this gives an excellent basis for a, uh, a classical lib liberal or libertarian perspective because we, we would then say, well, each person is try is, should try to achieve his end, or his goals as a rational being. He should try to live a rational life. And we say, well, one of the constituent parts one of the constituents of good life is freedom. Aristotle says it is very critical of, he says, being a slave is a very bad state of affairs to be, and we don't want to be slaves. Freedom is essential. So if we say that uh, freedom is part of the good life, so each person then would we'd want to work out his life, try to achieve a rational life, without interference from other people, at least so long as he doesn't interfere with them. So we could get a libertarian theory fairly readily from this. And in fact, uh, various, uh, various philosophers have attempted to do this, uh, one of whom was in the lecture room, uh, Roderick Long. And uh, we see uh, perhaps the best book that's come out so far is a, a book by... Uh, Douglas Denial and Doug Rasmussen called uh, uh, Norms of Liberty that argues on just this basis. Uh, there's on uh, Aristotelian theory of the good, we it, it combined with the view that freedom, including the freedom is good and that we can't coerce people into virtue, we get that, we get to libertarian conclusions very very readily. As I say, this book is by Doug Rasmussen, Doug Denial. I don't know what happened to Doug Affirmation. Uh, oh, sorry, you'll have to laugh now. Uh, but there is one possible problem with this, with this way. It certainly would be a very good way to go, at least in my opinion. But there's a problem with it is that that at least uh, uh, doesn't appear to be the way Aristotle himself went with his moral theory. Uh, in fact, there's one way of looking at Aristotle's politics in which uh, makes him out to be 
not an individual at all. Someone who's not, shouldn't be considered part of uh, ancestral to the classical liberal tradition. Uh, uh, Aristotle says in the politics, he says that uh, he seems explicitly to mention a quasi-libertarian idea, which he mentions that Lycophron, who was one of the Greek thinkers, had said that the, uh, the polis exi exists just only for the purposes of securing justice and protecting people. Sounds like something like a minimal state. And he says, no, this is not the correct view that uh, the policy exists so that people can live well. And further, he says that the policy is prior to ind the individual. So he, he says that individuals are parts of the policy. And he compares this, say, to it, saying that the hand is part of the human body. He says, if the hand is detached from the body, then it isn't a hand anymore. It's just uh, something that's just kind of a uh, some bones and flesh, but it isn't really part of, you can't really call it a hand unless it's a constituent part of the human body. So if you look at, if you reason on that, if you look at those passages, you could make Aristotle to be very much a um, collectivist. And in fact, uh, some people have taken Aristotle just in that way. Uh, uh, there's a famous book that was published in the, I think in, in 1945 or so, by Karl Popper called The Open Society and Its Enemies. And the first volume of this is a massive attack on Plato. Uh, it, Aristotle also comes in for attack in Popper's book. And he said, he, uh, Popper, particularly doesn't like Aristotle's notion of essences. He says something like, if you believe in fixed essences, or things this is somehow totalitarian. Uh, people think that they're fixed natures. Thing. Uh, if this isn't such as, uh, perhaps it's not as odd a view as it sounds. At first, it's a bit like the view I mentioned in the first lecture, but if you think there's an objective truth in morality, then this will lead to uh, totalitarianism or statism and that the people know the truth will uh, want to impose it on other people. So uh, Popper holds that Aristotle had this kind of organic or collectivist view of things and he, he mentions that in support of his view, he mentions that two great 19th century historians of Greek philosophy, the German writer Edward Seller, I'll put him down, uh, uh, and also George Grote, who was an English historian, he wrote a multi-volume history of Greece. He was a great friend of John Stuart Mill. They held that uh, Aristotle's politics was really very close, close in structure and views to Plato's laws, which as we've seen is not a very libertarian view, book. So uh, on this view then, Aristotle might have a pr uh, promising ethics for libertarianism, classical liberalism, but his own politics were completely the other way. He was a collectivist. Now, I don't think we should accept this view. And here I've been influenced very much uh, by a book on Aristotle that came, called uh, Nature, Justice, and Rights in Aristotle's Politics by Fred Miller, which was published by Oxford 1995, who argues that contrary to the, the very frequently uh, expressed belief, Aristotle very much did have a notion of individual rights. 
as some people like Alistair McIntyre said, rights are just the later invention that came in uh, sometime uh, fairly late uh, with, the, say, with the medieval nominalists or even later with Hobbes and Locke. We, we, ha we don't have, it would make no sense to talk about rights in antiquity, but Miller says he was an extremely good uh, Greek scholar, but no, Aristotle did have a notion of rights. Now, uh, unfortunately, uh, Miller's views haven't been accepted by most scholars, but I think he makes a very good case for it. I should mention also there is an additional article that supports Miller and argues that he hasn't gone far enough in ascribing uh, individualist views to Aristotle. This is by uh, Roderick Long, it's called Aristotle's Conception of Freedom, which uh, came out in Review of Metaphysics, I think, June 1996, if I'm not mistaken. Pages 775 to 802. <laughs> uh, don't check that, please. So uh, why should we accept this uh, particular view of Aristotle that says he, he was sympathetic to individuals, aside from the reason it's convenient for our own purposes to do so? Well, uh, one reason is we can get just from what I've said already. Uh, supposing Aristotle has the view, which clearly does, that each person is trying to achieve his own life, best life. He's asking how how can each individual live the best life? Well, it really wouldn't make sense to, then to say the individual should completely subordinate himself to the polis and then possibly uh, have to be in a situation where his own life is just completely uh, a tool of whoever is in power. Say he would have to, might have to give up whatever how his own good life because this would maximize the, what the good life for other people or the good life for the majority of people. Uh, why would how could Aristotle possibly hold both these this particular view of ethics that individuals should try to achieve their own best life and also hold that individuals are subordinate to the policy, just constituent parts of the policy. And so uh, uh, how could you have both views at the same time? Now, uh, what uh, Fred Miller has done is to look exactly what Aristotle says. What does he mean when he says that individuals are parts of the policy? Well, uh, it doesn't mean that really, although Aristotle does use this uh, analogy of the body, that isn't really expressing, wasn't the best uh, way really to grasp Aristotle's meaning. What he really means is that the one of the, of the goods we need for a good life, there besides, there are certain kinds of goods that Aristotle, they're called external goods in order to lead a good life, we need uh, not just certain qualities that we have in, internally, like rationality. We need external goods also. We need a certain amount of wealth. Uh, we need, uh, uh, we, one thing also we need is friends. We need uh, people reason together. They, uh, they require companionship. We don't just... Uh, think individuals in, as individuals in isolation. We require other people. A friend is what he calls a second self. So we need a, a larger community than just individuals uh, in which to lead a good life. Uh, Aristotle Trace, he says, uh, we, we, Paulus really is the complete community. We could have, we have stages we could imagine going through. We have individuals and families and combinations of households into villages but we need we have uh, we have to have a larger association in order to lead a good life because this is what's needed for uh, in order we, so we could have we could reason together and have political friendship the political friendships aren't as close as 
say, individual friends, a political friend wouldn't be a second self, but still we need to have these friendships as well as uh, as well as family or our, our families and uh, households. So uh, also one advantage of living in a city state is sometimes we might be uh, we, we don't have always in our lives have full control we don't always exercise our reason fully. We sometimes are overcome by uh, passions or desire we act wrongly even though we know what's the right thing to do and being in a city state this uh, the, uh, we're in a position where other people will be able to stop us from acting badly this is not a particularly libertarian way of looking at things but I mean this is one thing Aristotle said why we would want to live in a in a polis uh, so uh, it's, so in this way, it isn't that individual subor or subordinate completely to the group as this other view of the view that uh, Popper held and others, that individuals are just parts of the collective. It's that the, the policy the community is to the advantage of each individual. It isn't just that the policy is a benefit for the majority of people. It has to be benefit for everyone, every citizen in the group, has to, it has to benefit. So the view that the policy is, is a, a complete community or prior to the individual doesn't rule out by any means an individualist way of looking at Aristotle. Uh, now, uh, there we now, given that general point, though, we can now ask oh, what specifically does Aristotle say about how the polis, the good uh, city-state, should be organized? Uh, now, in the he holds the view that there is a single constitution. By when the Greeks talk about constitution, like when, when I was mentioning earlier the collection constitution. Constitution doesn't mean as it does in uh, contemporary America. Constitution kind of the uh, written body of fundamental law that we refer to the US Constitution. Constitution is the the principles not necessarily written down but sort of giving the structure of the way the city-state is organized, these the basic rules and custom by which it operates. Uh, the Straussians use the word regime, the Greek is politeia, so they, it's the, the really the basic structure of the society. So Aristotle holds that there is a single best constitution uh, that's true, that holds overall, and he also holds there's a second best constitution, but he doesn't confine politics to discussing what the best constitution is. He also does, uh, he just classifies all sorts of other constitutions and he asks what would be the best constitution given certain assumptions and then what is the best constitution we have reasonable hopes of adopting. He has all sorts of questions that he, he raises, but I won't be going into the details of those. But to see what he means by uh, best constitution, he has a, a basic way of classifying constitutions. He first, at, first we divide uh, uh, constitution governments into two classes, ones that, that aim at the good of everyone in the, in the city-state, and then ones that don't, ones in which they're just, they're just aiming at the good of some interest group within these. And the, the first group are the good constitution, the others are the bad ones. So the good constitution, the one in which are to the benefit of, aim the benefit of all the citizens in them. And here there are three good types. There's kingship, aristocracy, and polity. 
uh, a kingship it, it ruled by the one or the best, an aristocracy ruled by a group of the best, and polity is ruled by a, a larger group. It's, it's, not, it's similar in a way to democracy, but democracy is, it is bad in the bad side because, according to Aristotle, democracy is a, a system in which is run for the benefit of the poor people in the society, the large, the large class of poor people, not for the society as a whole, the city state as a whole. So the bad groups are corresponding to the three mentioned here, uh, tyranny, oligarchy, and democracy. These are the bad ones. In the uh, uh, in considering the good ones, there's a tie for first. Uh, kingship is supposing we had a system where there's a single person who's superior in virtue and knowledge to everybody else, then Aristotle holds that person should rule. That would be the best state of affairs. But that's something that's extremely unlikely to be realized, that a single person was the best uh, uh, overall. So the really the best possible system is one where all the, the citizens are at least are, are virtuous and they rule in turn over each other. Say some people hold office at one time, then others at another time. This is sort of an aristocracy, but it really consists of all the citizens in the, in the city-state. Aristotle holds, there's a basic principle he holds when he's trying to uh, dis, uh, explain what the best system, is called, which uh, Fred Miller has called the principle of rulership. And Aristotle holds that uh, no one should be, in any circumstances, should be ruled by anyone inferior in moral merit to himself, and he should only be re ruled by someone who's equal in moral merit to himself if this is based on a system of rotation, so that the equals would sometimes be ruling over each other, but no one would be in a permanently inferior position. So this is one of the uh, extension of one of when Aristotle talks about justice, he has uh, he has a, a, what he calls particular justice. General justice just means that. Uh, uh, were uh, gen uh, lawfulness, but in particular justice is distribution of honors or other good things. And he holds that distribution of honors should always be in accord with the virtue of the people involved. So this view of political rule is somewhat like his view of particular justice. He says you should never have rule by someone who's inferior in virtue, always the superiors in virtue should rule. So uh, to see the question how uh, libertarian is, is Aristotle's system, we have to, or how approach individualistic is it, we have to say that let's look at this best constitution, this aristocratic government where all the citizens rule, and we could ask is that a liberty, is that at all an individualist system? Well, it has the individualist element in it that really everyone, all the citizens are ruling. So in a way, it's strange to call it aristocracy and contrast it with polity because there are more pe more citizens, a greater proportion of the citizens are ruling in aristocracy, all the citizens are ruling than in the polity, which is kind of the good democracy, which is majority ruled by uh, the majority. Here, everybody is, in, is ruling, not just a particular class of people. In the polity, it's really a middle class, especially stressing a certain military class that's the dominant ruling element. But in, in, uh, in aristocracy, it's all the citizens are ruling. So, however, the society has 
uh, some decidedly non-libertarian aspects to it. Uh, for example, uh, Aristotle doesn't hold that as uh, Denial and Rasmussen in uh, 20th century libertarian Aristotelians hold that individuals can only develop habits of virtue if they're not coerced. He favors public education in which habits of virtue are inculcated by the government. He doesn't leave it up to the parents or families to develop virtue, and people have to have common meals. There are also regulations on, uh, on governing reproduction. For example, uh, uh, deformed babies have to be exposed. Uh, now, if it uh, uh, abortion though is is uh, is allowed only, I, I think abortion is allowed only though because Aristotle doesn't think that uh, the only only to the extent that the child is, the, the the fetus isn't considered. Uh, alive isn't considered fully uh, uh, conscious or alive. Once, once it has, uh, it, it could be considered at all rational, it would have certain individual rights, but uh, this, so the state could, in theory, require, the city state could require, if, if there, the, the city were becoming too populated, they re could require early abortions, but they couldn't, if a healthy child were delivered, Aristotle would hold, they couldn't require, that they couldn't expose the child. That would be violating individual rights to do that, but uh, not, not uh, early abortions would be allowed. Now, uh, the, perhaps the most serious, though, uh, non-libertarian aspect of a society is, come, we come to a, a notorious as part of the politics where Aristotle says that some men are slaves by nature. And what he means by slave by nature is someone who isn't controlled by reason, someone who is uh, just not capable of reason in the way I tried to develop earlier and wouldn't be leading a rational life. So those people would are better off, in his view, if they're uh, ruled by other people. And there are passages where Aristotle sometimes suggests a, a more beneficent view. For example, he thinks that uh, one it would be a good idea to hold out freedom as in uh, as a prospect for slaves. So it raises the question: Well, if slaves would benefit from freedom? Maybe they aren't that irrational after all. Uh, why would you hold this out as, of, uh, as something to, for the slaves to get if they're incapable of reason? But And then also, he suggests in some places, uh, uh, you can't have a friendship with a slave to the extent he's just a slave, but you could to the extent he's a human being. So uh, there's some question as to how strongly Aristotle would insist on this point that uh, there are some people who are slaves by nature. However, in his plans for, in his description of the of aristocracy, he clearly has slaves there and they don't have the, uh, they, they are not part, uh, part of, the, of the ruling element. They have to do what their masters say. So, uh, this is this is certainly not something at all combat, compatible with an individualist view, at least uh, for for them. Uh, now there there's some there's an a Straussian view. As he, there's always the separate Straussian view that when Aristotle said there people were slaves by nature, he was really attacking slavery because uh, most people most Slaves say in uh, say say slaves had been acquired by conquest. Say one polis would defeat another, and then they sell the inhabitants into slavery. They wouldn't be uh, 
inferior, incapable, being dominated by by reason, they they would just be slaves because they were they lost the battle. So they wouldn't qualify as slaves by nature. So on this view, Aristotle would be saying is really saying existing slavery is really pretty much all wrong. It's just in this odd case where we, maybe we have people who are mentally defective in some way. We could have justified slavery. But it seems hard to reconcile that interpretation with the fact that he does have uh, large numbers of slaves in his description of the of the uh, best state. Uh, so, uh, let me see. So uh, now, one uh, one thing also is very important. It, it, aspect of the aristocracy that uh, is very distinct in Aristotle is that uh, ordinary workers, or people who do, uh, say, labor, don't count, it can't become citizens uh, because Aristotle holds that in order to be rational, we need leisure time, say, uh, if I didn't have any leisure time, I wouldn't be able to think about philosophy. I wouldn't be able to contemplate or even do, uh, uh, I wouldn't be able to consider how, uh, how the best, what's the best life to leave, say, lead if I had to work, say, in one of, one of the uh, so, uh, my, uh, mines working, say, 18 hours a day, I wouldn't be able to be very, uh, about much time to reason, so those people don't have citizenship rights. And, uh, Aristotle has the view, it's somehow perhaps an unusual view, that uh, production where we act and make something outside of ourselves is somehow inferior to action that in which the, like thinking where the product of our action isn't distinct from what we're, our uh, activity in producing it. So the thought isn't something outside of us that we made like a tool, uh, but uh, the thought is in the, 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 really the action and the end are really the same thing just considered from other points of view. So this kind of view also, I think, in, uh, was part of his denigration of uh, manual labor, although now we have in English, you might have you might be familiar with the word. Uh, just put this down. Some of you may know this word. The uh, nausic would be uh, sort of uh, where it's a lower characteristic, especially of certain uh, unintellectual. And this is derived from a Greek term. Aristotle call, calls it the nausic activities. You don't get the, don't have full citizenship, don't have rights of citizenship because they're on a lower level. Now, uh, I should say the one way perhaps one can reconcile some of these views with uh, a more classical liberal approach is to say that Aristotle holds the view that consent is necessary for a, a good system, otherwise it's a despotism. If you have a system established without people consent, that counts as despotism. So people would have, except of course for the slaves, would have voluntarily entered into this kind of arrangement. So similar way uh, to something Hans Hoppe has written about where he says that people, he imagines people forming uh, sort of uh, societies within a libertarian order based on extremely conservative social values. So Aristotle is, in this way, is a bit like that. He's saying people have consented to this, but what they've consented to is, is not that they should always enjoy liberty in their individual actions. They've consented to being in a system where they're subjecting themselves to restrictions. And here I'm relying very much on in Made the point relying very much on the article by Roderick that I've mentioned. So, in conclusion, I think we can see that uh, Aristotle provides a very good basis, I think, for 
developing a classical liberal view, even though he didn't fully achieve that in his in as he developed his system himself. So I think we have a few minutes for questions or objections. Roger. Uh, in the T-shirts out there, Aristotle's name on it is private property. Do you know anything about uh, what Aristotle? Oh, oh, yes, that's a very a good, but I mean, he was very much in favor, I should have mentioned that, uh, he was very much in favor of private property in book two of the politics. He gives extremely negative on uh, Plato's proposals in the Republic of having uh, uh, communal property for the uh, guardian. He says uh, one uh, reason we, each individual it has uh, is entitled to property because this is each individual has properly some self love and each individual wants to have uh, property in which he can express himself. So you want it property for that reason. Also, uh, people need property in order to live, and there's a third motive that people need to be have the in order to display the virtue of generosity. People want to be able to have things to uh, give to others. People, if, if say, we had a communal property, you couldn't be generous because how could you give something that you have to somebody else because you wouldn't have anything to give? Now, uh, Terence Irwin, who I think is not very sympathetic to uh, uh, individualism and capitalism, in fact, he wrote in the Times Literary Supplement, he wrote an extremely negative review of Fred Miller's book, really suggesting that uh, Fred Miller was a political propagandist uh, for libertarianism. In fact, he, uh, which was odd because uh, Irwin had been a participant in conferences at the Social Philosophy and Policy Center, that Fred Miller was one of the people who run that. So it was apparently all right for him to accept money from them, but not then that, that didn't stop him from calling Fred Miller propaganda. But uh, Irwin said, well, uh, Aristotle's wrong here because we don't, you know, we could be generous and have the state could just temporarily assign us some property, then we could give that out to others. But it really, that isn't, that's a rather uh, pallid view of generosity. We really couldn't be very generous. It really was just, are as on loan as it were. So I think uh, Aristotle makes some ex extremely, uh, makes extremely strong defenses of property. Although in the um, in the we, people don't have in the uh, the best constitution, they can't amass as much property as they want to have property without restrictions. You could have the they could be required to give property to other people under certain circumstances. But again, again, this, you'd have the point that raised in your article about people voluntarily agreeing to such a thing. Uh, any, any other questions? Uh, yeah. yeah you, you mentioned one of your uh, goals was to look at the notion of objective truth leading to authoritarian systems. Yes. And Oh, oh yes, very much so. I mean, that, that's the conclusion I, I want to favor, that uh, I think you, get, uh, you, you could have a view that just what the objective truth is, is that people should be free to lead their own lives without interference from others so long as they don't violate other people's rights. Uh, the, the question of whether, I mean, I think we, if we want to support uh, Libertarians, we want that view to be true. If, if that's just a particular preference that pe some people have and not others, then we don't really have a good basis for saying for libertarianism it's just a, a, a preference particular people have and others don't. It really wouldn't lead us, get us very far. Dan. Uh, this perhaps speaks also to something that uh, Roderick Long worked on. Um, the uh, Aristotle contra Um Aristotle 
Aristotle um, doesn't like people don't like Lacan's idea of a kind of night watchman state. Mm -hmm. And that seems to be one of the charges that uh, people take Aristotle as not a proto classical liberal. Um, but it seems to me that Aristotle's anthropology is one of the reasons why he disagrees with Michael Locke. It's not simply that the night watchman, night watchman state uh, isn't status enough for Aristotle, but rather that Aristotle sees the purpose of a human community all is not just as a political unit, but also as a social unit, a socio-political unit, uh, as being a furtherance of these other goals. So Lycopron is basically, um, he's not going far enough back. Aristotle says, um, oh, there's more than just security, obviously, that a person wants. Uh, even a night watchman state ultimately has another purpose behind it, and that purpose is the reason that people come together and form a community, as well as a political organ, organ uh, is for these other higher goods, as Aristotle talks about, the virtues and the flourish of life. I know that uh, I think Roderick Long has said that he sees the polis as a uh, really being just the coercive and political element, and uh, maybe that's something that we really should sort of have to flesh in there. Now, is, is the polis, do you think, um, a purely uh, political thing, or is it also a kind of a social political blend that we can work on? Oh, oh yes, I see. I, I neglected it. I was supposed to repeat the questions, which I didn't. And the question was on uh, involved uh, Aristotle's criticism of Lycophron. That where he seems to be reje he's rejecting uh, Lycophron's minimal state views, was this because he thought that uh, Lycophron had wrongly thought only of, and the city state is a coercive entity, but what about it? Couldn't we take it also as kind of the possible kind of a larger uh, group involving certain social or civil activities, not just coercive ones? So. And the, or the question was, does Aristotle regard the polis only as a coercive entity, or does he have this broader view? Well, I think clearly he has the broader view because he calls polis is living, is an association for living well, a complete community. It isn't only, uh, he doesn't certainly think that not all aspects of living well involve coercion, not by any means. I think so he does very much have a combined view, and I think in the, trying to develop Aristotle's views, uh, in a more classical liberal libertarian way, I think the thing to do would be kind of to separate out the purely coercive part from the uh, <laughs> larger social group and say we could have these larger social groups without get having any coercion. And that's just what we're trying to do. Well, I think we're out of time now, so thanks very much. Now, tom uh, tomorrow we'll have to go on to... We're skipping to the Middle Ages. <laughs>